episode 73 of Real Life Ghost Stories. How you do? To kick things off this week, we need to thank our newest Patreon subscribers. We, we do, indeed. would like to thank Jerry Gregory. Celine Connie. Christina Rodebo. Rodeba? Rodeba? Bow, I'd say. Bow. Bow. Rod- 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 Rodebo. Rodebo. That's good. Rodebo. Like tree, maybe. Uh, Nikki B. Trent Page. Jennifer E. Hobbs. Titus Sitting Up. Claire from Exercise and Depression Podcast. Mary Agnew. Lily Clayton. Taylor Harding. Eric Abel. Daisy. Chris A. Melanie Leavers. Tori Hall. Kelsey Miner. Emma Lewis. Matt. And Faye Maury. Thank you so much for joining our Patreon. Thank you, and we love you. We appreciate it. And we would also like to thank some other people today too. Yeah, so um, obviously the, the times are a bit odd at the moment um, and everything is a little bit chaotic because of this COVID-19 um, stuff and obviously the majority of us are now on sort of extreme or getting towards extreme social distancing however there are some people that can't do that because they are very important people um, and they are dealing with this at the front end so we just want to over the next sort of four or five episodes we're just going to take Um, some time just to say thank you massively to our NHS staff and all our other listeners that are in roles that they can't stay home from because they're too important so I just want to start um, by saying hi and thank you to Soraya who is a operating department practitioner who has just been redeployed to the ICU in Kingsley Bex who's a critical care doctor Claire Katrina uh, Natalie Perry Parry even and Eilish if you've responded to um, our messages and you didn't hear your name that time, that's because we're just going to spread them out a little bit so that we spend a bit of time saying thanks. Um, we really appreciate what you're doing, uh, what you do on a normal day-to-day basis and appreciate it even more in this uh, strange time. So thank you very much. We massively appreciate you and thank you. And we hope that you keep safe and we recognise what you are doing. All of those, like Dan said, all those key workers who just can't stay at home they can't be on lockdown they can't practice social distancing because they are essentially the people that keep the country operating so thank you and we appreciate you we love you and we're going to keep telling you (laughs) all the time all the time thank you very much our film review is the omen the omen was released in 1976 it has 7.5 out of 10 on imdb and a massive 85 percent on rotten tomatoes would you like a synopsis i would love a synopsis please robert a married man agrees. <laughs> that sounded like the start of a betrayal story in like OK magazine. No, not OK. Take a break magazine or something like that. Yeah, take a break. <laughs> Robert, a married man, oh, ran dude. away with his wife's what's best the, friend. What's the equivalent? Stateside National Enquirer or something like that. Yeah. Robert, a married man, agrees to switch his wife's stillborn baby with an orphaned infant. But as the child grows, a sinister series of events starts to take place. What were your thoughts on this film? I love this film. Um, For very many reasons. And it's nice to do a sort of classic horror as well. Um, It's just, I think for the time, it's just really well done. And it didn't seem overly dated. There were a few bits where I was a bit like... (laughs) But there was also bits that were shocking, even still to this day. Yep. And bits I had forgotten about, like, the whole photograph scenario. And that has been heavily used yep. in other films going forward. I'm fairly sure one of the Final Destination films uses that entire storyline. <laughs> I'd like to say that this film is amazing, first of all. Somebody messaged me. I think it either was Jake or it might have been Matt. I don't remember who messaged and said that Gregory Peck sounds like house settling which is stunning Ooh, yeah <laughs> that is a really good description actually the musical score of this film is incredible yeah it's the fucking best thing about i the love man. that you know like in modern horror films you get all the strings in minor to sort of indicate that there's some kind of terror coming yeah. in this one you get like some gregorian chant and you get it works the, like, so ha, well ha, 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 ha. <laughs> um uh, yeah it's brilliant and and like the thing that always makes me laugh about this every time I turn it on is that Gregory Peck is an old boy at this point. <laughs> and he's got a very young wife having a baby, living his best life. Yeah, go on, Gregory Peck. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's just it's just a good it's a good film of the era. Um, and obviously like a, um, what's the word? 
Seminal. Seminal. Seminal horror film from that age, I think. I'm going to say something very controversial. I think Damien is very misunderstood as the spawn of Satan. Because actually, does he really do anything? No. Things just happen around him. Is it his fault? I don't know. I don't know. And I also think that Gregory Peck and the photographer guy are just very quick to accept things in this film. They all just accept that he's the son of Satan with no real convincing. I mean, they dug up his mum and his mum was a dog. So I think that's like an if indication. If I was to go and dig up a body, so they dig up Damien's real mum, I was to go and dig up a body and in that casket was a dog, I would not immediately assume that that dog gave birth to a human child. But you're, that, yeah, but you're talking about it as if that was the first thing they did. This is quite a long way down the path. They've had the father Brennan come in to tell him that this is yeah, the case. Very, very little evidence some, though, don't they? They've done some sort of sketchy searching and he's clearly, there is clearly something around him, around his aura. Because well, people have died him. around him, but he hasn't done anything, The first anything, person has he? that kills himself on screen goes, Damien, this is for you. This is how much I love you. And then throws herself out of a window with a noose around her neck. That's not just like someone accidentally tripping down the stairs. And then later on, he drives into his mum and knocks her off the landing. I'm sorry, he's misunderstood. I mean, he is a cute kid, actually. He's, he's not as scary as I, I... When I first watched it, when I was younger, probably too young to be watching it, actually, um, I thought the kid was freaky. But actually, watching it this time with you, and I've watched it recently as well, I'm just like, actually, he's, he's quite a cute kid. He is quite a cute kid. And do you know what? He, I really think he's misunderstood. It's just every now and then when he does that knowing smile, that world-time smile, where there's obviously someone behind the camera going, smile, smile, yeah. smile. <laughs> and he goes, mm, yes. Nobody um, can see you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Just does. to remind Sorry. you. I, I fucking loved it. It's just a classic, really, it is. isn't it? It's a real classic Absolutely film. a film that you should have a few drinks and watch with your friends. Not right now because that's not that goes against social distancing. But when this is all over, get some people together, watch the omen with some friends. It's just fucking gold. And you know what? Get all your spirits sitting down on the sofa. It's a great concept for a horror film. It's a brilliant it's concept. Deeply unsettling. Yeah, and it's all like poignant as well. Why is it poignant? <laughs> it's all like apocalyptic end of the world stuff, isn't it? Yeah, a little um, bit. So it's yeah, just alarming. <laughs> just dropping the uh, tone a little bit there. Um, but yeah, no, it's a really good idea for the for the um, for the for a film because actually it's based in it's obviously they take the angle of the Christianity spin, but there's a similar kind of thing in the Quran as well um, about the person that brings around the end of the world with similar markers. Oh, really? Yeah. So it does make an interesting story because it's based on something, and there's you know every there's there's a whole industry around um, end times theory. Yeah, that's what I'm going to go. All I'm going to say, but there's a whole industry around it, so it's all about ticking signs and stuff like that. And I just think it's a really well done film for its time. Like it really is for like for 1976. I mean, like, even it's good. even the decapitation isn't that cheesy. No, it it like the injuries that people sustain yeah. in this, they are not cheesy. The only one that is a little bit cheesy is when you go and see the burnt priest because that's clearly like porridge painted or porridge on his face. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean their, their special effects makeup was not great at the time, but the decapitation, the mm. guy getting the big like fucking stake yep. through his body, like yep. it's all pretty legit. Yep. Oh, I I really enjoyed it. My favorite part of this film, and I'm not going to say why, but if you watch it, the, my favorite part of the film is when the mum falls off the balcony. Yes, yeah, stunning. And that scene, that scene is 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 my favorite part of the film. Yeah, absolutely and I love stunning. Mrs. Baylock as well. She's great. She's a good. She's character. like the evil protector of yeah. Damien. She's actually she knows... an apostle of Satan. That's how she's described. Oh, is she? Yeah. So, what would you give this film out of ten? No, uh, why would I say out of ten? Out of five. Out uh, ten. 10 out of 5 <laughs> yeah. interesting no I love this film I'm really biased so I'm going to give it a 5 do you know what I'm going to give it a 5 as well because yeah. I actually thoroughly enjoyed yeah. watching it I haven't and... seen it for years and I watched it and went fuck me this was great for the time and you know what we're going to appreciate it even more later because sometime this week I'm going to make you watch the remake <laughs> I don't know if I even want to watch the remake I think some things should be just left alone <laughs> and that's one of them you know I, I don't understand people who subsequently called their child Damien after that film never will understand it was it you that showed me a message that someone said that someone at their school was of a similar age to them and their parents had the surname Thorn and had purposely named him Damien like that's the kid's actual name that's hilarious isn't it but also awful yeah so our story this week what do you know about the Sally house um, I, I know that I never want to go there <laughs> um, I've seen 
numerous investigations about this and I also have no recollection of what the backstory is because my memory is like a sieve. I'm going to tell you the story of the Sally house through the eyes of the woman who experienced it firsthand. Sally? No. (laughs) Her name is Deborah Pickman and she wrote a book called The Sally House Haunting, A True Story. And she documented her experience and her husband's experience living in the Sally House and what happened to them. Are you ready? I am as about as ready as I'm ever going to be to hear about this horrific story, so go for it. The story of Sally attracts endless rumours and theories of murder, cover-ups, racism and abuse. All the makings of a horror movie. But for Deborah, this was no movie. This was her life. In 1993, three months pregnant and newly married, Deborah and Tony moved into a new house. The pregnancy had heralded a necessity to move to a bigger house, one with more space and a yard to play in. The house was quaint, if a little run down, and the oldest one on the block. Despite the pregnancy, Deborah got stuck into making home improvements. The home felt calm and comforting and both Deborah and Tony were preparing to settle in to a new life together. Had they known what was already in the house, Deborah and Tony would have never moved in. It was difficult to say when the activity actually started. Deborah kept a journal of her time in the house, but hindsight is always 2020, and what seemed like odd events at the time took on a more sinister tone when she remembered back upon them. They had settled into a routine of snuggling down on the sofa watching TV after a long day, resting after refurbishing and resting before the arrival of their new baby. The first thing they noticed was the light in the sitting room. Sporadically in the evenings, it would alternate between dimming to a soft glow before brightening to full wattage. Keen to avoid any dodgy electrical work, Tony changed bulbs, checked fuses, and even brought in an electrician to fix the problem. But there was no change in the odd anomalous light flickers. One evening while watching TV, the lights dimmed as usual, and finding no other explanation, Tony snickered. We must have a ghost in the house. That was the last time the lights flickered. Almost as if what was in the house was awaiting their validation. For the first few weeks in their new home, their dog Sasha would stand outside the nursery, growling and baring her teeth at an unseen intruder. Tony theorised that she was sensing an unfamiliar animal outside, and eventually the growling became less and less frequent as Sasha became accustomed to the new house. In the last trimester of her pregnancy, Deborah struggled to sleep more and more. Deborah and Tony would regularly sleep downstairs with all the windows open to provide some sense of relief from the stifling heat. One night Deborah was awoken at 3.30am by a blood-curdling scream and the unmistakable sound of several loud thumps pounding down the stairs. As she tried to sit up, terrified that an intruder had entered their house, she was struck by something heavy in the body and face. She screamed, awakening Tony, who seeing no danger tried to calm her down. Eventually, Deborah calmed down and realised that the only intruders were her cats, who were pacing the room, hissing and growling with their hair standing on end. This could also account for the screaming sound and the thumps down the stairs, and Deborah assumed that a neighbouring cat had somehow gotten into the house and spooked them. There were regular electrical interferences with the house, many of which were put down to faulty wiring or goods, But when baby Taylor arrived and his new musical mobile began to wind itself up and play music and turn around whenever people were near it, Deborah and Tony began to wonder if there wasn't something more happening in the house. It was the teddy bears that were the turning point. It was late in the evening, around 10pm, and Deborah and Tony had just arrived home from visiting relatives. Taylor was asleep. So rather than disturb him, they left him sleeping in his car seat. Tony went to the nursery and came downstairs looking confused. Why have you moved all the teddy bears in the nursery? He asked. Deborah, equally as confused, assured him that she hadn't, as she had just put the finishing touches on the nursery earlier that day. Tony took her upstairs. 
Each of the teddy bears in the nursery had been neatly arranged in a circle in the middle of the floor. What? With their backs to one another. (laughs) Convinced that a family member had played some sort of trick on them, they tried to find a logical explanation as to how and why this had happened. Settling on the theory of a trick, they put all the teddy bears back in their respective places, turned the nursery light out and went downstairs. At the bottom of the stairs, Deborah turned to see that the nursery light had turned back on again. Frightened, they climbed the stairs back to the nursery to find one small bear sitting in the middle of the floor. In order to try and make some sense of the bizarre situation they had found themselves in, Deborah managed to make contact with a previous occupant of the house. The woman who had previously lived there told Deborah that she often smelled something foul, almost sulfuric in the house, especially in the nursery. She had frequently told her son off for leaving toys in random places throughout the house, and he was always adamant that it wasn't him. And her daughter had become obsessed with an imaginary friend called Sally, whom she would play with for hours on end in her closet. Her daughter had not mentioned Sally, since they had moved. During this time, Tony's brother Larry had made contact with a psychic he knew. He explained the situation to her, and she told Larry that the house was home to the spirit of a little girl. A little girl named Sally. That night, after talking the situation through for hours, Deborah and Tony made their way to bed. Tony froze on the stairs and pointed out something to Deborah. A photo of them on their wedding day that hung on the stairwell, had been turned upside down. Well, Deborah shrugged. Maybe it means she likes us. Tony's brother George was a sceptic, and not really interested in the goings-on in the house. He thought that there was a rational explanation for everything that had happened. He visited the house, and had brought his new camera to snap some pictures of baby Taylor. Before doing so, he shouted into the air, Come on, Sally! Say cheese and let me get a photo of you. He turned to take a photo of a teddy bear propped in the sitting room and promptly shouted in fear, stumbling backwards. The bear had moved, right in front of his eyes. He turned white in shock and fear and stumbled up the stairs. Tony and Deborah decided that they needed a few nights away from the house and packed up to go and stay with Tony's mum. As Tony was bundling Taylor into the car, Deborah felt a blast of icy cold wind. Tony grabbed his lower back and winced in pain. Oh shit, something's just bit me, he moaned. It wasn't until later, when they had arrived at Tony's mother's house, that Deborah remembered to check his back. As she lifted his shirt, her blood turned cold. On Tony's back were three five-inch claw marks gouged into his skin. It was time to call the psychic. Barbara assured Deborah that Sally was a little girl who just needed to be loved. She advised Deborah to return home and reprimand Sally for her behaviour just like you would do with any child. She told Deborah that Sally was protecting Taylor and that she had no ill intent or will to harm anyone. Barbara told her to invite Sally to stay in their home and that she would visit the next time she was in Kansas. Barbara's visit answered many questions for Deborah and Tony. Sally was benevolent, watched them all the time, interacted with them and protected Taylor. On Barbara's instructions, they got dolls for Sally to play with and created a little corner for her in Taylor's room. Deborah would write messages in crayon on paper in the corner for Sally and received no response until one day there was a little scroll. Deborah had written, Hi Sally, how old are you? in red crayon and left the crayon there for Sally to respond scrawled in green crayon which could never be found under the question was a very clear number seven things continued as normal in the household Deborah went about her day chatting to Sally and Sally would communicate by knocking things over switching lights on and off showing up in photographs as a mysterious dark blue swirl and opening presents that Deborah wrapped for her. No, seriously. Deborah bought her presents. 
and wrapped them up and left them for her to make her feel loved. When one photo was developed, Deborah swore she could see a shadow figure. A shadow figure wearing a wide-brimmed hat. But she didn't take much notice of it. Tony didn't heed Barbara's advice and give Sally attention. Instead, he largely ignored her. She would desperately try to get his attention, though, turning the stereo or other electrical appliances on and off repeatedly in his presence, lighting candles around the house, and so on. He had gotten into the habit of falling asleep on the sofa and was complaining about a bizarre sensation of something or someone biting his toes when he was falling asleep. (laughs) Deborah found this both hilarious and ridiculous. Until one evening, as Tony arose to go to bed, he cried out in shock and pain. Deborah rushed from the kitchen to find him removing his jeans. On his outer thigh was a vivid red welt, which, on closer inspection, was a set of child-sized teeth marks. Tony had been bitten with such a force that the bite mark turned into a baseball-sized bruise in the days to come. And it was then that Tony began to see shadow people out of the corner of his eye and in reflective surfaces around the house. One morning after a night shift, Tony was in the kitchen grabbing a glass of orange juice. He turned to retreat upstairs to bed. Standing in the middle of the kitchen was a little girl. A little blue-eyed girl who looked just as shocked to see him as he was to see her. When Sally lit candles around the house, Deborah would always reprimand her. Candles are dangerous, she would remind her. No more fires in the house. That Thanksgiving, Deborah and Tony had family around to stay. Deborah's sister Karen was napping in the sitting room and awoke to find a teddy at the end of the sofa ablaze. She panicked and ran with the bear to the nearest sink. After consulting Barbara, Deborah was told that Sally was simply jealous of the new people in the house. Shortly after Thanksgiving, Tony's co-worker Ray visited and was filled in on the story of Sally. He was amused by it, but not really invested. Until he went home. And Sally went with him. You see, Ray called a few days later in a panic. Was Sally still at their house? Was she able to follow people home? And why had she followed him home? Objects were moving around Ray's house, at will, and large pools of water were forming and disappearing with no discernible cause. What followed were several weeks of inactivity that led them to believe that maybe Sally had gone. They threw a Christmas party for 40 guests, with the children making crafts and fabric dolls for Christmas. While the guests were leaving, Tony went upstairs to get something. He had reached the top of the stairs when the fire alarm started ringing throughout the house. He turned to see that a fabric doll had burst into flames on the stairs behind him. He grabbed the doll, ran with it to the bathroom sink, receiving burns on his forearms in doing so. It was Tony who suggested that there was something else in the house. That they weren't just dealing with an innocuous little girl. Albeit an innocuous little girl who liked to start fires. He had awoken to a steady thump up the stairs. Monotonous, heavy footsteps. Thinking that there was someone in the house, he crept out of his bedroom and into the hallway. He braced himself, listening to the footsteps and waiting for them to round the corner to confront whoever it was that was in his home. The footsteps rounded the corner, but no one was there. They came closer and became louder. He felt a cold blast of air roar past him as the footsteps continued. He sprinted into the bedroom, waking Deborah up to tell her. He could sense a being, a shadow in the room, but eventually he fell back to sleep. Or so he thought. The next morning he told Deborah of a dream he had had. He felt a force drag him out of bed by the wrists. The force was so strong that he could feel his wrists burning. 
He eventually wrestled free of the entity and crawled back into bed. But when they checked, Tony had blistered burns on each wrist. What? In the shape of fingers. The new entity seemed to be a woman. She communicated through static on the baby monitor and particularly made herself known to Tony. She continued to visit Tony in his dreams, manifesting as a shadow figure before taking the form of a woman and attacking Tony. Sally continued her poltergeist activity around the house and eventually the media got wind of the situation and the house was visited by paranormal TV shows. The house was filmed numerous times for a TV show called Sightings and continues to be visited and investigated to this day. Okay. I'm pausing there. I'm stopping very abruptly and I will explain why in a few minutes. Is there more to come then? Kind of. Okay. A common thing that I get from sort of believers of ghosts is that, hey, at least, you know, nobody's ever died from a ghost. I am slightly upset by the fact that this ghost can start fires. So this, there's loads more to this story, but I would just be, I might as well just read you the book. Yeah. You know, if I was going to retell the whole story in that way. Um, so I would recommend if you if you're interested in the story, I genuinely would recommend reading Deborah's book, which is the Sally House Haunting: A True Story. But it's very repetitive for a single telling, so there's only so many times I can tell you about things bursting into flames before it gets burning, yeah, before yeah. it gets burning, <laughs> yeah. before it gets boring. But let me tell you, she treats this ghost like a fucking baby, like she literally bought presents she bought christmas presents she would knock around the house chatting away to it she would tell her how much she loved her when sally would set things on fire she'd call her into the room to tell her off it's the weirdest but that that's weirdest that's a whole other thing i'm i'm still i need to unpack this being a ghost being able to set things on fire a little bit okay i feel like i am under enough threat of our house going up into flames i don't know what you mean (laughs) from your candlelight and experience without having a ghost of a little girl randomly setting toys alight that is horrific that is a horrific thought it's just so bizarre and And it also makes me wonder okay so nobody's reported of dying by a ghost but how many random house fires have been started by ghosts and she um, have ghosts actually killed people and we've just reported them as other things and now I'm really concerned this woman Deborah believed that Sally would start these fires for attention and if nobody would notice the fire, that Sally would put the fire out. That was her belief. That was genuinely what she believed. And there was numerous, so <laughs> numerous incidences of apparently stuff going on fire in the house. I would be so fucking annoyed. I would not be treating that ghost like a child, scolding them. T- she would send the ghost to its room. She'd be like, Sally, you need to go to your room. That's really naughty. I like the idea of Sally knocking around with a little ghostly fire extinguisher though. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a girl though. It's not a baby girl. I'm, it's, oh, it's dangerous, isn't it? Like I can see why she did it because they, the you know, the medium said that it was a benevolent spirit. But I just feel like that's just accepting of it. Putting logic aside, yeah. So if ghosts were real, which obviously I believe they are, but if they were real, for those of you that don't, and they are the spirit of a dead human waiting to pass on, your responsibility as a human should not be trying to keep them here. So whether or not the some medium told you that this is the best way around it, I still don't think that you should be making making a ghost a resident of your house. Like you need to be trying to encourage them to move on if they are benevolent. And equally, it's fucking weird. It's just weird. Also, if it turns out that they're not benevolent and actually malevolent, then you're keeping them in your house. You're inviting them in, which is that whole black eyed kids, vampire thing. Don't invite them in. Don't let them stay. So you the, got to mark your territory, pee up the walls, that kind of thing. That went somewhere <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to go, but okay, I get where you're going. So the, the story goes on and it continues and she outlines the visitings of the TV shows and how Tony was repeatedly attacked during these visitings and blah, blah, blah. And then it actually gets really sad. And that's why I stopped really abruptly because as I was continuing reading, I was like, oh oh, this is a very different story than what it's portrayed in the media as. So Tony gives his account of what happened, which is entirely different to what Deborah's account is. So Deborah's account is this little cheeky little girl that she just loves and she looks after and she talks to who knocks around the house and she 
Deborah gets really obsessed in the story about her child having or suffering from cot death. And she firmly believes that Sally is keeping her child alive. Tony's side of the story starts off with him when the child comes along he starts to hear scratching in the walls Mm -hmm. and it gets louder and louder and louder. And then he starts hearing whispering around the house and he can't discern what the whispering is saying. And the whispering gets louder and louder until eventually he just hears constant voices all the time. He tries to tell Deborah, but she believes that this thing is like this sweet, innocent little girl. So he's thinking, I can't fucking tell you anything because you're not going to believe me. He's absolutely petrified. He's living his life petrified. He regularly physically feels the presence of this entity, whatever it is. They both believe that Tony is possessed at one point. Tony, this all gets very dark. So I'm just going to give you a warning that it all gets very dark. There's a whole chapter in the book dedicated to the fact that Tony accidentally puts one of the cats in the tumble dryer, which is horrific. And then Tony goes on to describe how... He is in the house one day and he puts down a cereal bowl and a neighbouring cat gets in the window and he turns and the cat is drinking from the bowl. So he picks up a knife, repeatedly stabs the cat, leaves it there for Deborah to find because he thinks, brilliant, She'll be. he was really proud of it. And then he thought, if she doesn't like it, I'll just fucking kill her. And then he comes to his senses and cleans up and he didn't tell anybody about it until years later. Okay, I know what your feeling on possessions are, right? So. But that is possession. That is like stereotypical possession thing, isn't it? Out of character. Do you know what it is? It's like your standard dad in a horror film. Yep. And I know know where you're going to go with this because I know what your feelings are on possession. But if that sounds like all the stereotypical things of possession it's that not being yourself it's being aggressive towards people you love it's killing animals which is just bizarre and awful she also talks about so deborah said said that she only realized later she never realized that tony felt like this at all and then there was one time when he was napping on the sofa and he just sat up and he looked at her and his face was completely contorted and he just went he's mine and then just both went back to sleep again. Oh, get lost. Oh, I need to tell you something later. And then she was like, okay. But my my Whoa. belief is that this is actually a really sad story. And that either there was some sort of psychosis related to, I don't know, anxiety or severe sleep deprivation because he was working nights and the baby didn't sleep at night time and they thought that Sally was keeping the baby awake at night time and that's why the baby wouldn't sleep and actually I think these are two people and this is just my opinion that had some sort of shared mental health situation and that their only way of explaining it away because I don't think anybody wants to think that their mental health is that fragile so the easier way to explain it away is to go hey it's the house is haunted rather than saying, hey, being a parent is so hard that actually it's caused me to be in this really fragile mental state. So I'm going to come back to the to the haunting side of things because I actually want to talk about it from that perspective. Okay. But but that's just my opinion. Yeah, yeah. So I don't believe it. But I'm going to ask you a question about mental health now. And yes. Is it possible that they were both suffering from postnatal depression? I think it is possible. Men can have like... What do you call that? It's not the same thing, is it, for men, but it's like a still after birth. You know, obviously women can have postnatal psychosis and they think it's partly linked to the absolute trauma that is actual childbirth. If you're that close with your other half and they're going through this awful trauma, then potentially maybe they could. Maybe they could have an experience of postnatal depression also or some sort of postnatal psychosis. But I don't believe the Sally House story. There's, there you go. And I don't think, judging by the book, it doesn't look like there is historical evidence that there ever was a Sally that lived in the house. Come and I do that. not buy the whole fucking demon, that a demon's grand plan is to come back to Earth, pretend to be a child, or pretend to be somebody with an innocuous name. Do you know what that is? That just sells fucking TV shit. That's it. There's my opinion. Okay, I'll come back to that. Over um, to you. So, but it started 
Oh, shit. Wow, that was dramatic. <laughs> I just dropped my mic. <laughs> I mean, that was an actual physical mic drop then, not, just a, not just a theoretical one. Um, <laughs> um, so, but it started before the baby was born, before Taylor was born, right? Yes. So, but, but no, hang on. Sorry. Come on, please. Sorry, I'm still, I'm I'm, sorry. I haven't gone back to the ghost yet. You don't have to disprove anything. I'm still on the mental health angle. I've got to stop talking. It could, ju- it could just be, it could be anxiety, right? So your life is changing completely. That could explain it. And then it leads into something being your life is different to what you expected it to be. And then that has an impact on your mental health. That's all I was going to say. Okay, now continue with your goal, Stango. Okay. So, so you're not going to shoot me down for that bit? No. Nope. <laughs> I'm literally sitting here covering my mouth. So let's let's say, let's say it is haunted. Let's just say it is. Okay. And let's say everything, let's take everything they say at face value and, and it being true. Because... Even if it is something else, it's what they've experienced, right? So it's how they they recall the experience. If it was a demon, I think it is a demon. (laughs) If you're basing your idea of demons on scripture or, you know, like holy texts in general, then the idea is that they're demons, plural, right? So it's not the devil on his own. It's the devil and his army of demons, right? Yeah. I'm always of the, of the, I'm always wary because I'm hyper scared of everything, right? But I'm always of the opinion that if that was me and it was my army of devils, <laughs> bear with me on this. <laughs> I'm holding on. <laughs> um, then I'd be a soul at a time. So actually, your your point about if you know if I'm going to come back to Earth and I'm just going to call myself Sally, and you don't know where it's leading, do you? And actually, if if that guy got to possessed to a point where he killed someone and then killed himself, by the line of the scripture, that that would you know that's souls, isn't it? I just feel like. Do you know what I mean? If you're going to have a grand plan, it's a very long term plan. I'd be looking for something more instantaneous, like instant souls. But then that's why maybe I wouldn't work but then, very well. Yeah, and also like actually, you know? yeah, without going too theological, does the devil know that ultimately he's always going to lose? So at the end, he's lost. Like that. That's like he's never going to match. He's never going to match God, right? So he loses at the end. So you you take small gains, right? If you know you're going to lose at the overall, if you're going to lose the war overall, then you take little battles. Or do you think it's just sort of a form of entertainment? We're so like you've got this demon in this house, and he's like, check this out, check this out, guys, 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 fire, nailed it, <laughs> and they're all like, oh maybe nice good maybe, form absolutely maybe like Sally House is a demon kindergarten. And actually, that's how they learn their trade. Maybe. So they, it's not actually one demon. It's multiple demons all doing their fire class, their fire starting class. And then once they've set fire to something in Sally House, then they get to move up the scale and get onto their proper possessions. And the thing is, you know, the whole cat situation must be really fucking annoying because the cats can obviously see them. Yeah. And they're just like, oh, for fuck's sake. Somebody possess him and get him to kill that cat, please. Absolutely. That was the kindergarten teacher. That was the that's kindergarten it. demon teacher. There's a real challenge, stretch and challenge. Yeah. Yeah. we're actually rambling and being mental now <laughs> so uh where do you fall down this one i think it's i don't think it's real because i believe in good and evil it can't all be mental health so that's all i'm gonna say okay fair you're allowed to fall down on that side of things too if you want to know more about the sally house i would recommend that you watch the buzzfeed unsolved the sally house one yeah, and I'm it's, fairly, it's <laughs> I'm fairly sure there's a Ghost Adventures one too. There is, but the Ghost Adventures, like, I'm get, I'm, I'm going to say this on on air, so oh to speak. Oh my god! I'm getting to the point where even I am starting to lose patience with Zach Bagans a little bit because he's literally, there is no such thing as a standard. You know, right at the beginning, where he's like, there was, there was an objectivity to him, and he was like, it could be residual energy, it could be like a a dead guy trying to pass on or it might be a demon now it's just automatically demons like there's no scope for anything else there's a flipping something falls off the wall oh my gosh there's a demon come out demon get the and it's just everything's demons and it's not everything's not demons Zach I'm just telling you now you okay now? yeah so don't go. yeah the ghost adventures one I think it's I think it's before he's got too bad but he's down that line do you want to um, hear some new reviews? yeah please <laughs> So we have a review from Paul Blue who says, Awesome. We discovered your podcast and ever since we've been hooked. Listening to all the stories you share has been fantastic. You guys make a great team and every episode is very entertaining. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Blue. Thanks, Paul Blue. And our second one comes from Miranda LS who says, Just the right amount of ridiculous. How dare you? 
We're I, never trying to be ridiculous. I'm not, I'm not even going to mock that because I'm like, yes, I am 100% ridiculous. That is my life. A fantastic combination of spooky stories and silly banter. Love this podcast. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, we Miranda. love you. And finally, Ash0397 says, I'm currently listening to podcast number 34, Ooh. Down Under. I just stumbled across this podcast while at work and I often listen to all sorts to pass the time. I'm in the last 10 minutes of Down Under. I live in Western Australia and work in Pilbara Mining. So this story is creeping me out. What's even more creepy? Well, it just so happens there's an old abandoned caravan and house near the mine site. I've only ever seen the Aboriginal family there once. They say that if someone passes away in the house, the family leave for a while for whatever reason. I don't think I'll sleep well at the camp tonight. Love your podcast. Thanks for sharing your stories. Thank you. We love you. you. And that has been, that was, that was a tough research actually because I had to read a whole book. Do you know what? It was really good. But I would recommend reading the book. The book is interesting. It was good. I was very interested. By especially it. for that last section. I didn't talk about what happened in the paranormal investigations because I just fundamentally disagree. And you can watch them. You can watch them. But having those conversations, it's like they're designed for TV. So they're kind of willing things to happen and trying to find things that might not necessarily be paranormal, blah, 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 whatever. So I'm just not into it. But I would recommend reading it. It is an interesting book to read. And if you enjoyed this week's episode, there are loads of ways that you can support us or loads of ways that you can get in contact with us. Yeah, getting in contact, I think, I just want to do this now before you go into your spiel. Um, Obviously, loads of people are locked down now. I know loads of massive, loads of cities in Australia and America um, and other places are in full-blown lockdown. The UK is going to go that way as well at some point. Please talk to us. Like, by all means, if you just need to um, just tell us what you had for breakfast... I'll listen to you. It's cool. Just send us a message on Instagram. Um, I've really enjoyed interacting with people over these last few days. Um, so keep it up. If you would like to contact us, you can contact me on Instagram at Real Life Ghost Stories, and you can contact Dan on Instagram at Fifty P Movie Club. You can find us on Twitter at Real Ghost Pod. You can find us on Facebook, Real Life Ghost Stories Podcast Facebook page. Give the page a like, leave a review if you feel so inclined, and join our supergroup, which is R L G S Supergroup, and the password is. Emma and Dan. If you would like to send us a story, you can do so at real life ghost stories podcast at gmail.com. And finally, no, not finally, before I say anything else, we have three different merch lines. We have our original no, artwork. That's not true. We have two merch lines, and Bim has our own merch line. Sorry, I take that back. <laughs> we have our original artwork merch. We have Abby's artwork merch, and we have Emily's tiny Bim merch. The links to all of those are in the description. If you want to support some artists, please feel free to buy Abby's merch and Emily's merch. If you want to buy our merch, fine. Do it if you like. But I'd prefer if you bought either Emily's or Abby's. The link will be in the dis- in the, d- b- b- the description. And if you want to donate $5 a month to us, you can do so on patreon.com forward slash real life ghost stories. Where... For $5 a month, you get an extra spooky episode a week. And for $2 a month, you get what, Dan? Um, An episode of 50p Movie Club, which is a podcast I do with Dave Keane, where we watch bad movies and we talk about them. And on that note, we shall see you next week. Bye.